everyone. Welcome to the Can We Ask You This podcast. My name is Corey. My name is Rosalind. Uh, and thank you for being with us today. We have a special guest with us, Lisa. Her story, grab some tissues. I was tearing up. Uh, it's, it's a hard story to listen to. We go through her mental health journey. There's some childhood trauma. Call it a trigger warning. There's yeah. a lot to unpack yeah. here. So there's hope uh, in the story. And I think uh, that comes through is talk about sexual abuse and childhood abuse and just that kind of trauma so if you're someone that's dealing with that and you're not ready to hear about it maybe skip this episode but if you are wanting to learn a little bit about the healing journey from that it's a great episode to listen to and get a glimpse into what it's like to deal with childhood trauma but also find healing in medical ways and that being okay so let's jump in yeah welcome lisa so glad you're here Hi, Lisa. Thanks. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, we're so excited to hear from you, uh, your story. We have lots to get through, but I'm just, yeah. <laughs> but it's just, it's going to be wonderful. And yeah, thank you for giving your time yeah. and being with us and, and our listeners today. Of course. This is my heartbeat. Yeah. So can you tell us maybe a little bit of background where you grew up, where you're from, and maybe just insight into your upbringing and your family dynamic and that kind of thing. Okay, so let's dive deep right away. This is a fun fact about me that I normally don't tell people. And oh. here, well, I, telling everyone. here I am <laughs> telling <laughs> everyone. Here, let's hear the um, fun so just in case this makes a difference to you and you want to turn it off immediately, I'm an American. I did not know that. Did you not know that? I did not. See? Well-kept secret. I feel con- so Canadian in my heart, and I'm just not Canadian on paper yet. That is the thing that's going to happen. But yeah, I was born in the States. I was born in Minnesota to a mom and dad family dairy farm operation, child number nine. And wow, nine. Yeah, I really upset the vibe. Fam had a good vibe going. Oh, and all of a sudden, four years after the last one, Hmm. because the first date were born in 10 years. Wow. And my mom was like, wah, freaking who? Everybody was like, woohoo, no more babies, no more diapers, no more screaming. Yeah, yeah, just kidding. Four years later, here I come. (laughs) And completely upset. (laughs) The the sense of peace in my family. Anyway, it is what it is. Wait, wait, was there a sense of peace with eight children in the house? I think it was organized chaos. Okay. I think it was organized chaos, and my mom was in a headspace of, oh, thank God I'm ready to move forward without infants and babies and diapers. And, you know, she, it was a dairy farm. There's a lot of work to do. Everybody has a job to do. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, but here I am, and now they're stuck with me. So it's all good. We're glad you're here. It's all good. I'm glad I'm here too. Born to a Christian family, independent, fundamental, Baptist, all those really interesting, legalistic kind of church culture titles. For those that don't know church titles, briefly share what that looks like. Maybe like a yeah. real life example. What okay, that looks like. for example, what that looked like in my real life was girls never wear pants to church unless it's church cleaning day. Then you wear pants because you're crawling around on your hands and knees and okay. scrubbing floors and stuff okay. like that. But you don't wear pants to church. You you wear dresses though. Or oh yeah, you wear dresses. <laughs> all the girls wear dresses. You had to have the right haircut. Yeah. It was all about behavior and appearance. Mm. So there was a lot of gloss over, you know, the arguments in the car on the way to church and the kids fighting and my mom saying, we're pulling up a church in two minutes, everybody put a smile on your face kind of thing, because yeah. nobody can know what's going on behind closed doors, right? Yeah. So it set up a culture of everything has to look perfect so we don't get in trouble with the church, so the church's reputation is not tarnished in front of the community, so we can continue to hold God high. And The thing about God is he doesn't need us to go through all of those Mm -hmm. things. He holds himself high, just fine, all by himself. Our human failures actually make him look a lot holier. Exactly. It sets up a dangerous culture for abuse, for spiritual Mm -hmm. abuse, for child abuse, for child sexual abuse, which in those cases were mine, and Mm -hmm. not a safe place to talk about it. Church should be a safe place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my church was not a safe place for those things. So can you, kind of jumping off that, can you tell us a little bit about some of the trauma you experienced, Mm -hmm. obviously, as you feel comfortable sharing how that impacted your mental health. Yeah. The day my brain broke. <laughs> okay. Beautiful day. Blue sky. June. Early summer. Flowers blooming. There's a deacon in our church that was just drawn to little children, little girls in particular. And everybody just kind of got the vibe like, that's weird, but whatever. I was so starved for individual attention 
because aforementioned Mm -hmm. busy farm life, youngest of nine kids, just, well, here you are, here's the path, just, you know, herd mentality. Right. This is what everybody else does. You do that too, kind of thing. We had a busy family. There was no such thing as just taking time out with one child to build relationship with your children. That wasn't done. There was no time for that. So I was a very sensitive child. I've always been a very sensitive person. I craved that kind of attention and that kind of relationship. I always needed that kind of relationship. And I found it in the form of a deacon who would pay special attention to me when I was little. Mm. Tell me my dress was pretty or my shoes were nice and, you know, tweak me on the cheek. And he would visibly bypass my sisters to get to me. And it fed fed my soul in a way and it fed my heart in a way that nothing else did. I did not know that he was grooming me and nobody else knew what that was. So nobody else recognized it. And honestly, it's like you count noses, nine kids into the church, nine kids out the church back home. And that was the amount of supervision most of the time that we had because we're in church. Church is fine. Church is safe, right? Mm, No, no, it wasn't safe for Mm. me. He did find a way to isolate me even further. He asked if it would be okay if I came home with he and his wife one Sunday afternoon for lunch and, you know, for the afternoon and whatever. He was playing on a theme that had been common in our family that I had no idea about because it happened before I was even born. I only just recently learned about this from one of my cousins, that my grandparents who lived in the same town, when my older siblings were little, every second Sunday or whenever, they'd pick one of the siblings to come home with them. And that would be their time at grandpa and grandma's house with the fun aunts. And that would give my mom and dad a break from an extra kid or whatever. And that was a regular practice in our family. You know, grandpa and grandma are taking so-and-so home today. Visiting family. Exactly. So this is a pattern and pedophiles are smart and they look for patterns. Mm. And he looked for the pattern. He found that pattern and he slipped just close enough adjacent to that pattern to make it reasonable that, oh, yeah, I guess we never did that with her. Sure, whatever. Hmm. And I was so excited. I felt so special. Yeah. I felt so special. And he molested me that afternoon. Oh, man. And I ran. I didn't stop for my shoes. And I ran to my grandparents' house. They lived on the same block as my grandparents in that town, um, just on the opposite side of the block. So I ran out and um, left my shoes behind, had my socks on, ruined my socks, ran down the gravel alley to my grandparents' house, And went inside my grandparents' back door and I stopped dead in the kitchen. And I thought, what am I doing here? My six-year-old brain knew I'm not supposed to be here. I can stand here until they wake up, but then they're going to have questions. Hmm. What are you doing here? Why are you here? You're supposed to be over there. I had no words. I had no language for what had just happened to me. I had no words. I had no context. But I knew I wasn't where I belonged and I knew that meant I would be in trouble. So can I just backing it up a little bit? Yeah. You went to this guy's house with his wife there. Mm -hmm. How did the, if you're comfortable talking about it, if you're not, that's totally fine. But how does that happen when she's there? Because you think it's a couple, it's safe. Yeah. He turned on the football game in the living room and got me interested in a guitar. I had never seen a guitar before, never touched a guitar before. And he was letting me touch it and he was letting me play it. Mm. I was absorbed in that. She went to bed for a nap. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When we don't want to get into the details, but that's, yeah. uh, yeah. And that gave him time, opportunity. Yeah. Yep. Wow. And I just wanted to touch on that because I think it's important. A lot of people, we assume if there's a couple there, it's safe. And then mm. you never. Yeah, yeah, not necessarily. Yeah. Not necessarily. And again, the aforementioned gut feeling that everybody, everyone in my family included, had about this man that was this, there's just something off about that. And nobody listened to it. Yeah. Because that's not a nice thing to say about a church man. And he was a deacon. Mm-hmm. So now you're at your grandparents' house. So now I'm at my grandparents' house and I'm standing in the middle of the kitchen. Oh, I can smell my grandma's pepper and fried chicken and <laughs> sunshine and my grandpa's chore clothes. And, that. It, oh. and I knew I couldn't stay there. And I knew it was not safe to stay. It was not safe to go back to his house. I couldn't walk the eight miles back to the farm. Nobody was at the church yet. There's no safe place for me. Wow. At six years old. At six years old, there's no safe place. No safe place for me. There is no safe place for me. Was he worried that you would go saying, like, you escaped, and then was he... He was terrified. Yeah. He was terrified. But so were you, it sounds like. He was absolutely terrified. So was I. But he was terrified. Yeah, because I, in that moment, that realization and that truth came to me. There is literally no safe place for me. I have words that I don't know how to say and there's no one to say them to. I can't tell it because he's a deacon. Mm -hmm. I can't say bad things about a church man. Because you felt like nobody would believe you? No one would believe me. I would be blamed. 
Mm-hmm. I was already in the way. I was already very inconvenient. It had already been made very clear to me. I mean, siblings are mean to little kids. It's just, it's just a sibling thing. But it had already been made very clear to me that the family was fine before I came along. I was in the way. I was unwanted. So you're already dealing and with And I'm already lot. dealing with yeah. microaggressions from my bully at home. And I'm already dealing with a mother that doesn't have time for me and everybody that tells me to be quiet and go away. I'm already spending a lot of time by myself. I'm spending a lot of time outside with my dog, spending a lot of time outside with the farm kittens. That was my job to keep track of the farm kittens Hmm. because farm needs healthy cats to keep the rodents down. So we have food to feed. It's a whole microcosm. Yeah. And everybody has a job in me included. And I was very happy to do that. I was very happy to do those things. Love spending time outside with my dog. Love, Love spending time outside with the kittens. So already I was isolating. Mm-hmm. which made it really easy to groom me, which, and now I'm kind of circling back, but there's that moment where there is no safe place for me. And in that moment I felt, and I even heard, it's like in the very center of my skull at the very, very top, almost as if a taut rubber band just got pulled and snapped. Hmm. I could hear it inside my own head. I could feel that snap. I could feel that break. Wow. And I started trying to figure out how do I mitigate this? I'm going to be in trouble one way or the other. What's the least amount of trouble I can get into? What's the least dangerous option for me right now? And for me, in my six-year-old self, in that moment, the least dangerous option was I looked down and I saw my socks had been ruined and I thought, that's going to be a problem. Hmm. And I turned around and I walked back to my molester's house (gasps) because that's where my shoes were. And I hid outside the house. I didn't go back in. I stayed outside under the weeping willow tree in the front yard and I wouldn't come out. And he sat on the steps trying to coax me. And I knew he was afraid, but I was more afraid of him. But I could register that he's very uncomfortable with this. He's very scared. Yeah. When I knew she was up, she had gotten up from her nap. She finally got up from her nap and came down and, oh, aren't you silly outside without your shoes? Come inside, dear, kind of thing. So, oh, stuck to her like glue for the rest of the afternoon. Yeah, I bet. I finally laid down on the couch for a little while, curled myself up into a ball, just faced the back of the couch, hiding my face. And he came up behind me and got down on his knees. I could feel the hot breath on the Mm. back of my neck. And he is frantic. And he's begging me, please don't tell your dad. Please don't tell your grandpa. Please don't tell your dad. Please please don't tell anybody. Please. He wasn't threatening me Mm -hmm. like many pedophiles will do. If you tell, I will kill your family. I will, you know, do all these things to try to. He was terrified. He was begging me on bended knee. What did that do for you? In your in your six year old brain, th- my brain my brain had broken. My brain had snapped, and I had no concept, no frame to put this in. I just started rocking myself, and I said, "There's nothing to forgive. It didn't happen. Mm. It didn't happen. It oh. didn't happen. It wow. didn't happen." And I rocked myself and I chanted that. And that became my mantra. When I started being overcome with memories, when I started being overcome with confusion and fear and hurt and pain and all of those things, I would just go to my bedroom and grab my teddy bear and curl up in a fetal position in the corner and rock. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And I taught my brain to forget for two years. It took me two years to tell my mom. Wow. So what did that do for your view of the church in general? Because a deacon represents a lot Mm -hmm. to a lot of people. And whether right mm-hmm. or wrong, I don't think anybody can perfectly represent Jesus. But as a six-year-old, especially a deacon in the church, would be somebody that you mm-hmm. that represents Jesus to you. Yeah. What did that do for your view of that? I carried over the concept of I was an unwelcome accident to my family. I am also an unwelcome accident to God. Hmm. Okay. God loves the whole world. Oh, yeah, you're here too. I guess I have to love you too. Hmm. And that framed my view of everyone and everything, that they were stuck with me. So you had to like apologize for your existence. Existing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And stay small, stay quiet, don't call attention to myself, which I'm really not very good at. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's it's funny how it can go one of two ways. When you feel starved for attention, you can not call attention to yourself or you call a lot of attention to yourself. Yeah. 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 And I'm not saying you do that, but it is interesting to see how like you are somebody who now that I know, I mean this in the most loving way, but you do command the attention of a room. Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. interesting that that was your trauma response. Yeah. Well, and I think in a way it started, I was being a bit passive aggressive. It kind of morphed into a passive aggressive attention seeking kind of things. Like you don't want me here. Okay, I'm going to double down. Hmm, okay, interesting. I'm going to create a situation that you can't help but notice that I'm here. Yeah. 
any attention. And now you're just going to have to deal with it. And you don't like it. That sucks to be you. Hmm. And I became very, you know, passive aggressive. But I also grew up in a very passive aggressive, sarcastic culture where that was kind of our love language. And that's kind of how everybody teased each other. And it wasn't funny unless it was mean. One brother that was my primary bully, like all the microaggressions, it was just drip, 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 drip. And he wouldn't stop until I cried because then it was funny. Hmm. It was just, and that's just kids doing kid stuff, right? But adding my nature, adding the damage and the trauma that I had already gone through, adding the trauma of sexual molestation and the further trauma, the deepest trauma didn't happen when he molested me. The deepest trauma happened in my grandma's kitchen when I stood there and realized so clearly, so obviously, so truly that there's no safe place for me on this earth. Yeah. That's the trauma. As six years old, what do you do with a whole life spinning out in front of you? And that's when my suicide ideation began. Wow. Thank you for for sharing that because I think a lot of people who are listening who have struggled probably haven't put into words Mm -hmm. those feelings. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you experience something like that when you're young, it almost stunts your ability to put those into words. So I can see you've done a lot of work to learn how to to do that. So thank you. I want to ask a question about your, because you mentioned your family, you yeah. told two years later. Yeah. Um, I just want to spend some time asking you how the family dynamic played in two years later. <laughs> what was the result? You know, even what went right, what didn't go right, yeah. and how that affected you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. That's a really good question. It's an important question. The answers to that question formed my ideas of God and who he was and why or if I even mattered to him. So two years later, I told my mom what had happened to me. And I I struggled to explain this because two things happened in my brain simultaneously. We were in the car driving home. We were driving through the town and I pointed down the street and said, that man's house that's down there, I don't like him. And she said, why? And I told her why. And then later I had a memory of telling my mom And we were standing in the farm kitchen, and she looked at me and said, I don't have time for this. I have to go finish the laundry. And she turned around and walked away. So my brain was kind of weighing, okay, which which one is this? And that was my only memory, and that's when the conversation ended. For years and years and years and years, because I had spent two years teaching my brain to forget. So my brain was forgetting. My brain's really good at forgetting. Even now, forgetting is my superpower. Wow. Like, I can forget something my husband had to remind me three times last night before I had left the house to remember to put gas in the car because it was down to like eight percent or something stupid <laughs> like that. I said one of these days I'm gonna get a call from the Deerfoot it's like there's a betting pool on when Lisa's gonna run out of gas on the Deerfoot the Deerfoot is a highway in Calgary if yeah you're not local yeah. yeah and it's like the worst place to run out of gas mm-hmm. in the middle lane like mm-hmm. just yeah mm-hmm. he's convinced it's gonna happen I'm like stop manifesting this but anyway <laughs> that's that's a that's a side story Um, So I'm really good at forgetting, and I continued to forget. After that moment of telling her, nothing was done that I remembered. I just continued my self-soothing and my chanting. It didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen. And I buried it really, 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 really deep. So later, after I was married in my 20s, all of a sudden it came back to me. It was like a tsunami. It was like that wall finally cracked and crumbled and flood. And it was like I was right back there. And the trauma was fresh. The trauma was new. Steve came home from work, found me in the corner chanting, freaked him out. Hmm. Chanting Um, it didn't happen? mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the nightmare started. All these trauma responses just started compounding. And he said, we really need to go to the farm for the weekend. You need to talk to your parents about this. You need to talk to your mom. And you need to find out what really happened, if anything other than that really happened. Because at that point, my memory of, like, I did not have a super great relationship with my mom because my memory of that moment was her walking away. Mm -hmm. And that just confirmed the bias that I'd already believed, that I didn't belong, that I wasn't wanted, that I was in the way, that I was inconvenient. Nobody wanted to deal with me. You're just too much you're not worth anything and all those kinds of things. So my brain created a scenario that confirmed my bias. So when I, we went back that weekend and I sat down with my mom at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee and said, mom, I need to tell you something that happened to me when I was little. And she got tears in her eyes. She said, you can stop there. I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? She said, I remember, I remember the day you told me I've never forgotten. I've remembered every day the rest of my life. Mm, It impacted her. 
And I said, well, can you please tell me what happened? Because I don't remember. I remember being in this kitchen telling you and you walking away. She said, no, no. Oh my goodness. No, that's not what happened. She said that I did tell her in the car that one flash of memory that I had was correct. When we got home, she took me to the flower beds to weed the flowers because that was on a busy farm. That was the only place my mother was undisturbed. Because if we bugged her when she was in the flower garden, she would put us to work weeding flowers. And that was the <laughs> last possible thing we wanted to do. That, that was the only farm. way she got yeah. peace and quiet on that farm. Oh, Literally the brilliant. only place. Yeah. So she knew that was like mom's weeding the flower bed. Stay away. Stay away. Yeah. Don't draw her attention or you're going to get caught into it too. So she took me to the flowers to weed a flower garden that didn't need to be weeded. <laughs> My poor mom. <laughs> she didn't have very many weeds in her flowers, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so she took me to the flower garden to weed the flowers because she knew we wouldn't be disturbed. And she said, I told her the whole thing. I told her everything and I clung to her and I cried and I said, mommy, please, mommy, please don't ever make me talk about it again. I just want to forget. Wow. She said she went to my dad and she told my dad and she and my dad decided together that if that's what I wanted, maybe that's what they should do for me. It was make it possible. Just let me forget. forget. Just let me forget. Like it never happened. Because in that day, I mean, it was the early 70s. In that day and age, this would have been 1970, 1972. Children who made accusations like that weren't believed. And they didn't want to do that to me. And then my mom said something so pivotal and shocking to me that made so much sense to me in the moment. I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But later, I'm like, it blew my mind. She said these words. She said, we couldn't risk the reputation of the church and the family for this to get out. Wow. Do you think if you had said, I want to talk about it, I want to deal with it, do you think that because she said we decided that if that's what you wanted, we would go with it? But do you think if you had expressed that you wanted to put it all out there in the open, would Mm. they have changed their tune? That's a fascinating possibility that I have never, ever considered. No, I don't think they would have changed their decision. Hmm. I don't. Hard to know, but because of what my mom, but yeah, I mean, but because of what my mom said later, yeah, that we couldn't risk the reputation of the family and the church, which goes back to what I was initially saying about the legalistic Baptist culture and the appearance of evil. And we worked really hard to create a perfect facade of a perfect family behind which facade. My mother struggled with mental health issues, and she was angry much of the time. And I had to be careful sometimes what I wore on a Sunday morning to make sure the bruises on my arms were covered. Mm. Because no one can know. No one can know. If no one can know how I got my bruise, no one can know what that deacon did to me. Right. That would take her church down. Yeah. And then who's left to represent Jesus in this town? Right. If that's how you're representing Jesus... Mm. So many things that just broke my brain in the moment. In the moment, we're sitting having coffee. I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, of course you would sacrifice me hmm. for the sake of reputation of yours in the churches. Of course you would. Mm-hmm. But now I think of that, and I have had to do a lot of work on trying to understand where she was coming from, trying to understand her own trauma responses from her own early childhood experiences, what brought her through life experiences to bring her to the point where that was a good thing to say to her child, that yeah, it was worth sacrificing yeah. you, my child, my daughter, You were a worthy sacrifice to protect my reputation and my church's reputation. What had she have had to experience and gone through Mm -hmm. to get to that point where that made sense to her? Because I'm a mother of two daughters Mm -hmm. and I would go scorched earth in two flat seconds and not feel sorry yeah, and not care who (laughs) I took down. Yeah. And I've had to do a lot of work on grace. I have had to do a lot of work on forgiveness about that moment. But the interesting thing is that when I went and talked to my dad later that day, We were sitting outside and I talked to my dad and I went through the whole same spiel with him. And he's looking at me like, what are you actually talking about? He hadn't talked about it? He had no idea what I was talking about. If that happened, I'm really sorry, but I'm really confused. I've never heard any of this before. Wow. But mom told me that she told dad. And that is just another thing. One more thing to break my brain that made no sense. But I was talking to my niece one day and she said, no. No, that's not my grandpa. And you know that's not him. You know that he didn't know. He wouldn't have forgotten. Because when I went back to my mom and said, this is what dad said, she said, oh, you know your dad, out of sight, out of mind. He's just very forgetful and whatever. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Again, reinforce the bias of, 
I'm not worth remembering. Even something that traumatized. My trauma wasn't yeah. worth remembering. Yeah. My trauma wasn't worth registering long enough, yeah. longer than the time it takes to swat a fly. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, that's not something it you forget. Does it, no, yeah. it doesn't make sense. And my niece told me, she, the way my grandpa loves me, the way my grandpa loved me and my sister and my brother, and the rest of us kids, you think he would hear that? That somebody did that to his little kid and he wouldn't lose it? That he wouldn't go scorched earth on them for you? Mm -hmm. That's not who he was and you know that. You know that about your father's character. Above and beyond what you have been told about your father, you know his heart. Mm -hmm. And that reframed everything for me on a spiritual level because above and beyond all the cracked up, Backwards things people have told me about God and about his rules and what he expects and blah, 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 that kept me oppressed and kept me down in that legalistic culture above and beyond all of it. I know my father's heart. Hmm. I know his heart for me. Yeah. And that changes everything. Yeah. And once I was able to reframe that, so many things started clicking into place and making sense. And I began to see my mother through the eyes of she experienced trauma too. Mm -hmm. And so much of her life was trauma responses of being overwhelmed and not knowing how to deal. Good grief. She was a farm wife on a dairy farm with nine kids. That's traumatizing. How is that's traumatizing (laughs) in and of itself? She had no she had no control whatsoever over her reproductive body. Like she had no autonomy. She had no say over like even medical decisions. Do I go on the pill? Do I not go on the pill? I don't know. What does my husband say? Because that's what legalistic culture says. Husbands lead your wives, women submit to your husbands. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, if God doesn't want us to have any more kids, I guess we won't have any more kids. Not even thinking about what it was doing to my mother. Mm -hmm. So Eight babies in 10 years, and four years later, she finds out she's pregnant again. Of course she was traumatized. Yeah. Even mentally, I mean, yes. you know, just pregnancy does a lot for your hormones, even that. And then it having does. that many it ups does. and downs and ups and downs and ups yep. and downs, eight times over plus one more later. Yep. That's, and there is scientific evidence of how fetal development happens and how fetal brain development happens. And when the mother is in extreme emotional distress and is in any kind of distress, disrupted, that kind of thing. She was in distress. She was in trauma level distress of being pregnant all over again. And my brain developed through her distress very specifically in that I was born literally in hyper aware threat assessment. Hmm. That is so fascinating. And it, and it bears out the brain scans I've had that it bears out. Yeah. That just that hyper awareness. I've been on I've been on threat assessment alert from the minute I was born. So I was constantly being aware who's coming for me, who's coming for me. Am I safe? Am I not safe? Am wow. I safe? Am I not safe? It's just an autonomic response for me. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a choice. It's just how my brain works. Looking for safety. Yeah. 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 So what? And then discovering there's no safe place for me. So to jump off of that, what was the thing that triggered you into wanting to seek? help for your mental health after you've gone through more trauma than a lot of people will have gone through in a, in a lifetime. So what led you to wanting to deal with that? Because also I think that's a big step wanting yeah. to. I think it starts with an awareness hmm. of there's something that I need help with. So what And I was unaware until my marriage broke down and I went to one Saturday morning. She's with Jesus now. God bless Marie. Went to my assistant pastor's wife one Saturday morning and my marriage was breaking down. Life was just spinning out of control. And I stood on her front step and I said, you need to give me one good reason right now why I am not packing my bags and leaving. Wise woman. And she said, I so much want to have that conversation with you. And I have to go grocery shopping. So why don't you come with me and we'll talk while I shop. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm such like, a good idea. <laughs> okay, I'll, you know what? I'll take it. I know I showed up on your doorstep unawares. I didn't call and give you a heads up. It's a Saturday morning. Of course, you've got stuff to do. But she folded me into her day. Hmm. A day that Hmm. she had no time for me. She made time for me. And wow, what a huge impact that made on the girl who nobody had time for. Just the fact that she did that just was a balm to my spirit and a balm to my soul that I was important enough to her to talk to that she would take me grocery shopping so she could do what she needed to do, but still give me what I needed. And I followed her around the Safeway, just Mm -hmm. verbally vomiting everything. And she listened and 
checked off her list and listened and shopped and uh uh-huh and uh uh-huh. And we got back in the car. She said, okay, we're going to talk about this again, not before you tell me that you've seen your doctor and been assessed for depression. Wow. We were still in legalistic Baptist culture. We were in a legalistic Baptist church. We were living in Winnipeg then. And for her to say that Mm -hmm. was against everything that the church would have said. She said, I want you to Call me and tell me when you've made an appointment. I want you to call me and tell me when you've gone to that appointment. Tell me what your doctor says. And then we're going to take this a step further. But she said, I love you and I'm praying for you and you're on my radar and I'm not going to forget about you and go to your doctor. Do you promise me you're going to go see your doctor? And I'm like, this is the weirdest conversation I've ever had. Like so and, foreign to. Okay, I guess I'll go see my doctor. So my doctor assessed me for depression and I hit it 10 out of 10. And that was my first inkling that I was also dealing with, what do you mean not everybody thinks about suicide every day? Really? Didn't occur to me. I I mean, when that's your norm. I mean, that was my norm. And there was no safe place to talk about it. So when I was eight years old, sitting on my back steps, staring at my father's rifles, trying to figure out how to contort my body, that's not a normal thing for an eight-year-old to think about. Oh, wow. And that's something that you had grown up as normal. So As normal. Yeah. As normal, raiding my parents' medicine cabinet in the middle of the night and all that's there is Tylenol and being frustrated that there's nothing. Just, yeah, terrible, terrible, terrible depression and suicide ideation. Knew I was depressed. Didn't know that there was anything that I could do about it. Didn't know anything about suicide ideation. Didn't understand that that was a thing. I never attempted. I just fantasized about it a lot. Wow. Wow. And you probably couldn't have told anybody that. I could not have told anybody about that. Didn't occur to me that I should. Right. Because my brain has never not worked that way. Mm -hmm. So my doctor put me on antidepressants and within two weeks began to feel, wow, this is what normal feels like. Mm -hmm. I can finish thoughts. I can finish sentences. I'm functioning so much better. Were you not able to, like, what was that like? Sorry, you say I wasn't able to finish thoughts or sentences. Was it just? Brain fog. Just brain fog. I had intense brain fog. I was faking it through days. I was just, you know, it's a whole fake it till you make it. It's pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Nobody at church wants to hear your problems. Mm. Just put on a smile and fake it and you're fine. And I had grown up in a very musical family, very performance culture. We were, you know, we were like the Minnesota Baptist Association Von Trapps. I was going to say Von We Trapps. sang everywhere we went <laughs> yeah. and yeah. put Le- little Lisa up on the apple crate. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so performance culture, it's, yeah. it's just, it's perform, 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 perform. Yeah. And that's how you gain attention. That's how you gain good attention. That's how you gain approval. That's how you gain everything good in your life comes from good performance. And that's the only way I knew how to live. Wow. So now you're experiencing the world differently yeah right so you, yeah you've, you've seen a doctor yeah uh, you've, you've sought help I would love for you to start talking about some of the the healing process because mm-hmm. it's been a journey it has been it has been a journey but I would love for you yeah. to expand on as you start kind of understanding healing and finding healing in your mental health mm-hmm. uh, what worked for you just kind yeah. of elaborate on the process of healing antidepressants, and two really safe, really good girlfriends. Okay. There's still a big stigma around taking medication for mental health. Mm-hmm. There's still a big stigma around taking medication, specifically for depression. And it's the whole faith component gets brought into it. Well, did you have your devotions today? Maybe that's why. Yeah. Maybe, did you do this? Did you do that? And, it, and again, it's like, now I'm performing in Christian culture. Mm-hmm. And I must not be performing and doing all my Christian duties well enough and not praying enough and not believing enough and not having enough faith. And that's why I'm still depressed. And I was actually told by a family member that they would set me up and pay for long distance phone counseling with a pastor of their choice. But I had to promise to flush my drugs down the toilet. These are not drugs. This is medicine that my doctor gave me. Yeah. Stop making me feel like I'm scoring crack on a street corner. Uh, But that's the way I was (laughs) treated. That's the way I was treated. And the stigma was like, but my brain was beginning to clear enough to say, no, yeah, no, this is not appropriate. Also, you have never been where I am. So I will not hear this from you. Mm -hmm. We will not have this conversation again. You don't get to speak to this place in my life because you have not been there. And I think the thing that a lot of people misinterpret about antidepressants is it's actually, it's called a negative drug where it's actually adding something that Mm -hmm. your brain is supposed to have yeah it's like telling yeah. somebody with diabetes that they should stop taking their insulin because exactly it's like no no you're supposed to have that and it's exactly. the same way with antidepressants it's not exactly adding right. something to your body yeah. that it shouldn't have yeah because my brain was born broken and it got more broken through trauma mm-hmm. and through trauma and through trauma 
Mm -hmm. and my brain could not do what it needed to do. So I needed help to help my brain to make up for what my brain wasn't producing for me. And And there's absolutely no shame in that. And you, and you knew this, uh, Mm -hmm. because you, the brain scans. Yeah. yeah. Later on. So I was on antidepressants, white knuckling my way through, through depression and depressive bouts for 25 years on and off. Mental health is a cycle. Mental health conditions are cyclical oftentimes. Depression, I'm handling it really, really well until I'm not, and then I'm not. And it doesn't necessarily need to be because something happened. What happened? What's going on? It doesn't necessarily, sometimes it is situational. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just the illness being the illness. Depression is a jerk. It doesn't yeah. care what, it's, what you've got going on in your life. If it's going to flare, it's going to flare. Mm-hmm. It just does. And trying to put it in a frame of, oh, my depression is doing this because of, I had to learn to stop doing that because then that made it my fault again. Yeah. It didn't, it took it away from being a brain chemistry yeah. problem yeah. to a yeah. situational problem. Yeah. And I had, yeah. yeah. And, and I had to learn if I don't say it about cancer, if I don't say it to a diabetic, if I don't say it to someone else with thyroid imbalance or with a broken leg, I'm not going to say it to myself about my depression. Mm hmm. Because illness is illness is illness. Amen. It's yeah. just illness. Yeah. It's just illness. And we need to stop shaming each other for our illnesses. And I'm done yeah. shaming myself for my illnesses. But it was really, really hard and you need good people around you. I was on the phone with my sister-in-law. I had never heard of neurofeedback before I talked to my sister-in-law. And she was telling me about this, that she had discovered this in the States and that she had been doing this for a while. And she didn't want to tell anybody that she was doing it because, again, in my family culture, she's mm-hmm. the other ones. She's like, oh, yeah, she's just all this woo-woo kind of stuff. Just get right with God and you'll be fine kind of thing. So she had been keeping it to herself, but it had been working. Her depression had been lifting. Her just It was having dramatic effects for her. And she was explaining to me how I was just standing in my kitchen crying, saying, God, why can't I have this? Mm. This is what I need. Why can't I have this? I need this. This is what I need. And she said, just out of curiosity, like, how did all this start? Like, who even invented this? The guy who invented, can't think of his name now, the guy who basically invented neurofeedback therapy Mm -hmm. is a Calgarian. Oh, wow. That's cool. (laughs) And when I looked into it, because I'm thinking, oh, yeah, this is in the States. So, of course, it's not here. Like, how... Like, I will never be able to access this. Fine, you know, like Mm -hmm. my bratty, sarcastic self. Fine, God, I'm going to show you because I'm going to Google God, Neurofeedback Calgary, and nothing's going to come up, and I'm going (laughs) to prove to you three clinics. Wow. Wow. And I'm like, this is is potentially accessible? You have options. Three clinics. (laughs) This is potentially accessible for me. Yeah, there are, wow. is yeah, like it's not even just one. It's like the, I get to I get to. I, yeah, is this a possibility? God said, "Yeah." Are you done being a brat now? <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, maybe for now. <laughs> I'll look into it. Yeah, and I did, and it's incredibly expensive, and it's incredibly difficult to access unless you've got the money to do it. Because, and that opens up a whole other chapter on healthcare that I'm not going to get into, but. And how mental health is underfunded by our government and Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But, oh, God, but this is what I need. Like, that's just so mean. You're going to dangle this in front of me and say, but you can't afford it. La, 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 la. You know, (laughs) no, no. That is not the heart of my father. Mm. That is not the character of my father. That's good. Father, I need this. Mm -hmm. And out of the blue, my husband's mother decided to do an early bequeathment of inheritance to her two sons. Oh, wow. And that same week, bloop, Steve's like, well, you're not going to believe this, but wow, here's this chunk of money. Did you know this was coming? Did she say anything? She said, nope. Wow. She just did it. And we look at each other because we've been talking about yeah. this and we're like, maybe this is actually possible. And the hope that was terrifying me, because hope is a scary thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Hope is a vulnerable, terrifying thing. Mm-hmm. And I was so scared to hope. But it was over that Christmas. It was Christmas 2020. Mm. The world was in chaos because we were pandemic and isolating. And the girls were both home. Brittany was home because she lives here. Adriana was home because she came because of pandemic and isolation and blah, blah, blah. She came like four weeks early for Christmas. She basically came, flew out from Ontario and spent the whole month. And then Brittany moved in because... 
then we could be a household and we could isolate together oh, right. yep. and then we could actually have our Christmas together. So mm-hmm. that's what that looked like for us that year. And the kids saw me struggling. The girls saw me struggling. I was struggling really hard. And they're like, mom, this is not okay. Your coping strategies are not good and they're not healthy and they're not working. And we are really legitimately seriously scared for you. Like I was tremoring. Wow. I was like, when you look at the side effects of the drugs that I was taking, they were all ticking. And the medication is fantastic until it's not. Mm -hmm. And my medication has had to be changed several times over the years because none of these medications are supposed to be lifetime medications. They're not built for that. They're not manufactured for that. They're not designed for that. So they don't last for more than a few years for real efficacy. So let's, let's bring it back to the healing process, the brain scans, the therapy. What was that like for you? So you're, Let's jump into the therapy here. This yeah. is yeah. this is something that's before you. Yeah. You're going to you're going to do it. Yeah, I'm right? going to do it. <laughs> My family and I agreed. I pressed pause on absolutely everything in 2021. This is yeah. going to be the year I heal. This is going to be the year I focus on me and I get better. And I get better for real and I went to the clinic and I had my initial assessment and I had my brain mapping done which is basically like these electrodes these caps that are wired that, you know, they put it on their head and they have those like special glue stuff and it sticks, sticks it to your head. And then I just basically, you know, sit there for like 45 minutes and they run this brain map and it, you end up with a, a fully colored picture of your brain of all like a 3d, like a 3d kind of image. And he could pinpoint when I came back to look at it with him, he could pinpoint. Yep. I see your early childhood trauma. It's right there. Wow. And there was an actually a spot on my brain map. My sister-in-law had the same one because she was molested at an early age as well. Wow. And is that something that they've seen That before? is something that they see. There is a place wow. in your brain at that place because our brains develop and they grow and they mm-hmm. change. But when your pr- brain is traumatized by that kind of severe emotional trauma, it just stops growing and it's stuck there and they can see it. It's actually visible on my brain map. That that was the spot. He also found wow. a concussion from an old car accident. And he also found <sighs> like, okay, he's like, yeah, I see, you know, this and this and this. And That's there's so all wild. this stuff. That, and I'm like, this is fantastic. <laughs> wow. I can get enough of it. This, he said, yeah. And I said, I totally forgot. I didn't even mention that. That, yeah, I guess that she he said, yeah, we can fix that too. And I'm like, you can what? Wow. You can what? Yeah. So they targeted, what are, we, what are we going after first? And so they targeted treatment. I'd go in for my neurofeedback therapy, similar kinds of caps. And it's basically all wired in to like, looks like a 16 channel soundboard. And the tech is there in the room with me. And they're like, you know, fiddling and like, you know, getting everything set and turning it on. And I'm just watching YouTubes. I'm watching like everything there is to you? know about mm-hmm. brains and neurofeedback. And while it's fixing my brain, my brain is learning about what's fixing my brain. So I'm kind of double dipping, <laughs> hey, which is really cool. Count, right? <laughs> when I ran out of brain science YouTubes to watch, I watched all the Brene Browns and I watched oh, all yeah. the, you know, like, and I'm just chatting away with my texts, which were fantastic. I'm most wow. amazing people. Just, oh my word, the people there, they really do care. And they are personally and emotionally invested Mm -hmm. in their clients. They were personally and emotionally invested in me and just love them to pieces. So after four weeks of going in, getting the crazy caps, getting wired in, doing the thing, doing that like twice a week, four weeks later, they did a new brain map, completely different brain. And did you feel different? I was beginning to feel different, but I was scared to trust it. Mm. Fair enough. Scared to trust something. I was scared to trust new, it. Like a new I was, experience. Were you still taking medication at this point as well? I was still taking medication, okay. but the plan was at a certain point when I started to notice XYZ and like the, the side effects of the medication were all of a sudden getting dramatically worse. He said, that's the sign that we need to back you down by half. He said, now, how do you think your doctor would feel about being willing to de-prescribe you? Hmm. not all doctors are great with working with naturopaths for one thing, which Dr. Corey Deacon is a naturopath. Not all doctors are willing to work with other disciplines and support paramedical and that kind of thing. My doctor's fantastic. She was fascinated because I'd gone in and told her and said, okay, this is the plan. This is what I'm doing. My goal is to get off my meds. She said, sweetie, that's probably not going to happen. At the time I was on Pristique and Wellbutrin. These are the kind of medications people don't come off. You might transition to something else, but you need to understand, like manage your expectations here. Mm -hmm. Said, I know, I know, but this is the goal. 
and this is what I'm going to do. And I'm blogging now. I'm going to write about it. So here's the address and you should keep up on it because I'm going to blog my way through this entire thing, which I did. And she started following it. She had never heard of it before. She started doing research. A month or so later, I went in just as a checkup with her, say, this is what's going. She's like, this is fascinating. I've never seen anything like this. I can think of 50 patients right now that need this. How do wow. they get it? Wow. And we can put the blog post yeah. in the show notes. Just, okay. well, yeah, we'll make that available for people. Yeah. It's, yeah, it was fascinating because I post all my pictures. I post all my all my brain maps, all my, and point out the ways, like, this is what it looked, do a side by side. This is what it looked like before. See that spot? Now it's gone. My concussion from my car accident back in the 90s was like, it was blue one scan, it was gone the next. So for the skeptic Mm -hmm. who thinks that, I always like to play devil's advocate, but I understand that this is from a place where I'm like, I'm with you. But for the skeptic, what is the, there might be somebody that's like, well, they probably just fabricated the scans but can you tell me your story about Mm. what you felt the difference was for like for somebody who's like I don't know if I believe the brain scans maybe but let's hear your story too about what that difference felt like for you the biggest change that I noticed immediately that my brain was working really hard to repair things and to build new neural pathways was that I was exhausted Mm. yeah after 45 minutes of being wired up Getting in my car, I had to be super intentional about staying alert because halfway home I could have fallen asleep. Wow. And that is not like me. I am not a napper. Yeah. But I would come home and I would literally crawl to my bed and fall asleep for three hours. I'm like, this is weird. Yeah. My brain was exhausted. And it's a different kind of tired. It's a kind of, I can't even explain it. It's not a physical body fatigue, like, oh, I worked out really hard or Mm -hmm. whatever, and my body's exhausted, my whole body's exhausted. I just feel really tired, I need to rest. Even when I feel really tired and I need to rest, my brain, my hamsters are flying on their wheels. I can't get my brain to shut down. I can't get my brain to to go quiet. This kind of work that my brain was doing to rebuild neural pathways that had been broken, (sighs) close my eyes and I'm gone. Wow, yeah. I never had that kind of sleep before. It was shocking. Mm -hmm to me. And then I started, it was just the fatigue and just resting. And they said, it's good that you press pause on everything else. Some people do this on their lunch breaks. <laughs> oh <my laughs> I'm I like, know. how? You just hope how? they're not like bus drivers I just, or yeah. just somebody who has well, to be alert. <laughs> and they might only do it once a week, which means it takes them longer to get to their okay. outcome, right? Yeah. I had the gift of a husband fully supporting me saying, this is your one job and I am so happy. And for you that you have this opportunity, whatever you need, this is our focus. This is our priority as a family right now to come around you and to give you that. Oh man, what that did to support my healing. So uh, talking about healing as well. So what was the, did you have anybody and you touched on this, but did you have anybody that was kind of discouraging this sort of therapy in terms of the in in the proximity of the church just saying like you just have to pray harder or you know it's a lack of your faith that's a very interesting question because it wasn't said to me directly but you pick it up in you pick up that feel and you pick up that culture in the periphery of conversations Hmm. right in the oh we will pray for you yes pray for me and this is a real medical thing that's working. Yeah. And it's kind of like that was just kind of ignored for, oh, we're just going to pray harder for you. And I felt like it was being minimized. And I felt like it was just kind of being downgraded. Mm. And it was kind of like a version of them patting me on the head. And yeah. I hope you're not wasting all your money. And, and we're just going to pray harder for you. And I learned who my safe people were. And I knew, knew who to, to not talk about it to. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. one thing, Corey and I were talking yesterday, actually, and I said, I think we, we forget, you know, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above. Yeah. And we often think that it means good and perfect, like it, it has to be perfect, but sometimes mm-hmm. it's, it's good, but not perfect. And so I think sometimes we think yeah. medical intervention yeah. isn't from God because it's not perfect or it's not, mm-hmm. you know, divine healing. Mm-hmm. But I think we forget that actually medical intervention like this Uh, Mm -hmm. remapping of the brain or medication is good. It is good. And maybe like you said, the medication doesn't last for a lifetime because it isn't perfect, but that's okay. It's still a good option if you need Mm -hmm. it. It got me to where I needed to be. It kept me stable enough 
and kept me in this world long enough to get to the thing that was actually healing and actually curative. Mm -hmm. And God is in science. I was just going to say. God is in, (laughs) God is in neurofeedback and I have a picture that proves it. I was getting my brain mapped and I was just sitting there in this, the tech that I was with that day. We've had so many interesting conversations about faith, about God. He grew up in church God culture and kind of like left it behind for science Mm -hmm. culture. So we had lots of really interesting conversations about ways that God and science can intersect and that we have science because of God. And so we're sitting kind of chatting away and I'm just sitting in this moment of intense gratefulness with my head all wired up and goo in my hair and electrodes and like, oh God, thank you. Just what a gift this has been. Mm. What a gift. Mm -hmm. How much I've healed and how much better I feel. And just, oh, never in my lifetime did I feel I would would ever imagine that I would get to that moment of feeling like, oh, Mm. just so grateful for the healing and go so grateful for the way God, God provided it. So I'm inside my head in this moment. And all of a sudden my tech goes, oh, I've never seen this before in my life. I need to screen grab this because my brain waves were apparently doing something very unusual. I have a picture of it, but I'll try to explain it. He said in his study, in his research, he has done a lot of research into where they've actually gone into and brain mapped monks Hmm. who meditate for months at a time. Yeah. And what do those brain waves look like versus what do brain waves look like on other people, other situations kind of thing. He said, I have seen this in books when they did this thing with the monks. I've never seen it in real life, but here it is. And I screen grabbed it. Do you want to see it? Yes. And I'm like, yeah, I want to see it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Are you kidding? I want to see it. And it's usually like there's a brain wave on the bottom that reaches up about halfway. There's a brain wave on top that reaches down about halfway. But in that moment... My brain waves went all the way up to the top of the screen. Hmm. And the brain waves on the top went all the way down to the bottom of the screen. And he said, that's what prayer looks like. He said, what were you doing? Wow. So I was praying. I was, being, I was so grateful to God. Yeah. Just in that moment of gratitude, God, thank you so much. He said, this is what it looks like when wow. God reaches back and says, you're welcome. He's changing and rearranging. Amazing. And yeah. it's just, I will, I'll treasure that picture That's for the rest so of my cool. life. And that moment with him, because it just like opened, it's like it took one more layer, a filter off his eyes to see God in science. Yeah. That's very cool. And, and it was yeah. such a cool moment. I love that you talked about how, you know, God originally you felt like God was dangling this in front of you. And then you yeah. said, no, that's yeah. not my father's heart. And when you tell that story, it's like, yeah. that's your father's that's heart. That's my father's heart. Yeah. That is so cool. For me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if that's for me, Mm -hmm. that's for everyone. Mm -hmm. That's my father's heart for you. Mm. That's my father's heart for everyone. Yeah. That's so good, Lisa. What would you say to somebody who is in the place where they feel, whether they grew up legalistic or not, Mm -hmm. or they just feel ashamed that they need some help beyond what they are capable of doing behaviorally? What would you say to somebody who's in that place of depression, anxiety, Name your mental health struggle. Yeah, yeah. What would you say to somebody? Rick Warren said it best, and we say this in Renewing Hope all the time. Your sickness is not a sin. Sorry, preface what Renewing Hope is. Oh, Renewing Hope, our new mental health ministry at First Alliance Church. Very excited to be leading it. It is a guided 14-week course, guided by facilitators through all kinds of topics. Topics like shame and forgiveness and just what mental illness is, what it isn't, what does God have to say about it. God has a lot to say about it. Good coping strategies, good tools for your mental health toolbox, better ways to respond in in times that you're in crisis. And it's just, it's an exciting program. It's really good material. It is growing. So proud to be part of a church who is leaning hard into this ministry and literally creating safe space inside church walls for people to talk about mental health without shame and without stigma. I think that means a lot coming from you, considering that you, at six years old, had no safe place, including the church. And man, if the church isn't the safe place, what is? Right. The church needs to be the safe place. Mm-hmm. It just needs yes. to be the safe place. Mm-hmm. You know, it is full of broken people, but yeah. But I think you're part of changing how yeah. it's perceived. And I think yeah. it's really, really cool testimony. 
about kind of where you started and now you are leading the mental yeah. health ministry. That's, that's someone that actually sat in the room with us in Renewing Hope and said, is it okay to say that I have fill in the blank hmm. because I'm sitting in a church? Is that okay to say out loud? Wow. Yeah. I'm like, oh, honey, you are exactly yes. why we're here. <laughs> yeah, yes. totally. And you are exactly why I will continue to show up and be here for this ministry for however long I can. Because, yes, you're safe to say that here. Mm-hmm. You're safe to say whatever you need to say here. You're safe to feel whatever you need to feel here. Because as Rick Warren says, your sickness is not a sin. Your chemistry is not your character. Your mm-hmm. illness is not your identity. It's good. It's a sickness. It's chemistry. It's illness. Mm -hmm. Not your identity. Not identity. God gave us our identity. Mm -hmm. God gives us our identity. Mm -hmm. Our Father's heart for us who loves us and says, yeah, you're worth something. I gave my son to die for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, your value is huge. We use that I got from you, Corey. We use it all the time. The Father's Love Letter. Oh, yes. that has been a game changer. It's yeah. been a game changer for me. It's been a game. I share it with people all the time. It's a game changer with people who struggle with their identity of their worth, of self-worth. We're like, going to have a lot of things in the show notes. <laughs> just going to yeah. say, <laughs> add that to the list. Add, <laughs> add that to the list of resources in yep. your show notes because it is a yeah. game changer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for me. I was born with a hyper-aware threat assessment brain. God knew that. So if I say that God created me in his image... He knew that. He understood it. He saw my journey, and he's never for a moment not been there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People do terrible things. It doesn't mean that God let that happen to me. It means that God gave us all the gift of free will, and some people misuse it. Mm -hmm. And that does not minimize what happened to me, and that does not minimize whatever trauma has happened to you. But what it maximizes is the greatness of our Father, that he can take those things and heal them and bring us to a place where now we are uniquely equipped to help and to encourage and bring along and welcome into the family those that are the most vulnerable, those that are the most broken, those that are the most misunderstood, those that have been the most stigmatized, mm-hmm. those who in, in the past have been told in the church, you're only good enough if you do X, Y, Z for us. Mm -hmm. If you can perform your way into our approval, now you're good enough to be here. That's not our story here. No, That's not our story at FAC. That's not our story in Renewing Hope. And that's a big part of why we wanted to do this podcast is because we got to rewrite the story. We have to rewrite the story. We are changing the culture, but we need to be talking about how we're changing the culture. And we need to be talking about how it's safe here now. Mm -hmm. It is safe here now. Mm -hmm. Brokenness isn't bad. It's just broken Mm -hmm. because we have a father who can fix it. So come bring it, bring it, bring it here, Yes, bring it here. That's good, Lisa. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I know that it was not said lightly and not easy to Mm -hmm. go through. So thank you for sharing just the amazing story of your healing and giving God the glory in that I think we often forget to give God the glory yeah. in scientific ways of healing as well. So Absolutely. Uh, so thank you Absolutely. for doing that. Just to wrap it up, any final thoughts, anything mm. you know, that you want to, to leave with our listeners? Again, I also just want to say thank you. It's not easy to come and share, like almost relive some of the trauma. I know you've yeah. had healing, right? But it's still... It's, <laughs> it's different sharing it now than yeah. it used to be sharing it before neurofeedback. That's, so yeah. now it's more of a referencing okay. where before it was more triggering. It's not triggering anymore. Hmm. Well, thank you then for being able to share of your healing journey and being, a, yeah. being in a place. I'm sure you could have never imagined, you know, to, no. to speak about it as a, a reference instead of a trigger. That's, yeah. That's, Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That yeah. is very, yeah. that's very yeah. interesting. So, yeah. But yeah, thank you again. So final thoughts for our listeners. <sighs> See, this is where I'm going to get emotional. It's okay. (laughs) This is a safe place. This is a safe place. Yeah. I do still get emotional because I have deep empathy for myself and for what I went through. And I have deep empathy for what other people are going through and still suffering through. And it's uncomfortable and it makes it difficult to talk, but I'm going to try. If you're struggling, know that that's normal and that's not something to be ashamed of. And you don't have to struggle alone. It's okay to struggle. It's not okay to struggle alone. Not okay to struggle alone. Mm -hmm. And we have resources. 
We're yeah. here and we can do this together. And it doesn't mean that the Jesus wand is going to come out and go whirly, whirly over your head. And now you're not going to struggle anymore. What I'm talking about is now we have a culture where it is safe to struggle together mm-hmm. and we don't have to be alone in that. And if I have a tool in my toolbox that helps me and you don't have it yet, you can borrow mine mm. Ooh, that's good. until you have your own tools. We share tools. We open up our toolboxes in Renewing Hope every Monday night and we dump them out on the table and we say, who needs what? Mm. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And let's help you build your toolbox. It's good. And I still have emotion over it. And that's okay. And a part of that is probably you're also, I mean, this is a buzzwordy, but you're reparenting yourself for oh. your child work and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's buzzwordy, but it's also really, really relevant yeah. and really, really yeah. true. And it is and a lot of hard work. And I am still yeah. doing the hard work. I will continue to do the hard work. I am not fixed. There is no context for now you are well. Mm. You can <laughs> now lead renewing hope. No, no. Yeah. I still struggle with stuff. My facilitators still struggle with stuff. We are building a culture and renewing hope where you don't have to be perfectly fixed to be able to serve someone else. I hope that goes to like, I love that that is the culture and I hope, and that's my prayer for the church, the big C church, that that is the culture we're starting to build where it's not about appearances and it's not about, you know, looking perfect. And frankly, if you thought you had it all together, you probably shouldn't be leading the mental health ministry anyway. People get (laughs) alarmed when I get emotional think, oh my goodness, are you okay? I will pray for you to continue to heal. No, 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 you don't get it. It's actually the reverse. It's because of my healing mm-hmm. and because I am off my meds that have suppressed all of that natural emotion for so long that now my tears are just, oh, good. We, okay. The floodgates are open. Floodgates are open. Yeah. Here they come. And it doesn't mean that I'm not healed. It means that I am healing and I continue to heal. Emotional expression is part of the healing process, and I'm not ashamed of it anymore. Thank you, Lisa, again. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, It's my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for spending time with us and your openness and vulnerability. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that episode. I know I really appreciated a lot of what she talked about when it comes to medical healing and that being something that is used by God for his glory. And that is his heart for her. Yeah, I like the brain scans. I've actually looked at the brain scans and it's fascinating. Yeah. Like it's it's truly fascinating to see the before and after from neurofeedback therapy. therapy? I think that's what it's Is called. That, <laughs> yeah. I know I'm always with medical names and stuff, I always get them mixed up. But yeah, really cool to hear her story mm-hmm. of how she found a healing in that way. I mean listening to her story obviously there's there's so much to it it's so dynamic she's worked through so much trauma and i really appreciated just obviously her vulnerability and mm-hmm. sharing with us from past but also knowing that she did find healing yeah it took time mm-hmm. but i loved her tenacity mm-hmm. uh, her not giving up and her fighting for her healing yeah and i think it's important also to point out that god does heal miraculously and we don't want to ever negate that but I think sometimes especially in a church culture we forget that it's also okay to seek medical scientific help because God is also in that he created those raw materials and he gave us ideas and brains and sure he can remap the brain but also he can use people along the way and who knows I think sometimes we have to broaden what our view of healing looks like Because we think like God should just, you know, I like what Lisa said, wave the Jesus wand and it should just all be fine. But sometimes God is healing his world by giving Lisa that chance to talk to the person that was helping her with her brain scan. That's him healing his world because she's a witness to that person. And so that is healing. And she did receive healing physically as well, which is really cool. Yeah. And also just, I think for anyone who's listening, who wants help, we kind of said earlier, like there are resources for you and available and don't be afraid to reach out. And we hope that you can't find community, whether it's here at FAC or uh, somewhere else that you could find a safe space mm-hmm. to be heard, to be known and to be loved. Mm-hmm. Check out the show notes. We'll put some links to the Renewing Hope, which is the mental health ministry if you are local to Calgary. But we'll also always feel free to send us an email and we'd love to connect you with a place in your town or city, wherever you are. Yeah, maybe, I mean, if you are listening, maybe you are a pastor and you would like to use the course. 
Mm. Yeah, I think we can take it. Uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we love sharing here. So. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of that, please do make sure to share this episode. Give us a review. We're not just saying that because we want great reviews, but the reviews and the five stars do help us get noticed as a podcast. And we're not doing this for numbers, but we are doing this because we think it matters and that these stories matter. So we would love it if you would help us with that, please. And thank you to our producer, Ryan, for your time and energy at just making everything sound wonderful. So we appreciate you so much, Ryan. Yeah. And thank you listeners for being with us on this journey of, I mean, we're still a relatively new podcast. So I thank you for journeying with us and with our, our friends as we ask difficult questions and, and hear people's stories. So yeah, thank you for being with us. We'll see you next time.